Oh, Cynthia's coming in, so good thing we waited a few seconds. Or Anna, I'm not sure. It's a Gilmore anyway. <laughs> Hi. Good morning, Anna. Or Cynthia. <laughs> Cynthia, I know that giggle. <laughs> okay, I shall pray. Ah, oh, dear Father in heaven, we greet you this this morning with a good morning and gratitude in our hearts that we can gather at this early time at the start of our day and connect and share hearts as we discuss your word and we invite the spirit of truth to be among us and that our hearts and our minds may be aligned in the understanding of your word and that we may know how to apply it into our lives and that it may strengthen us as a community. We are so grateful to have these new scriptures, understanding that it is one of the, among one of the greatest events in the history of the world and that we can be a part of it. And we are thankful for all the labor that has gone into um, the research to gather the most accurate um, version of what your servant Joseph Smith, um, what you restored through your servant Joseph Smith. And we say this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Cynthia, I just have to let you know, I really love your uh, YouTube videos, your music channel. I'm glad you like it. Mm -hmm. uh, Melissa, I don't know if you know, and others, uh, Cynthia started putting her songs on YouTube and they are absolutely beautiful. She's very good at writing meaningful lyrics that just get right into your heart. Oh, Plus, she's pretty you. cute too. <laughs> <laughs> so the question that we were going to review today was, I think, question 17 which, uh, let me see if I can see what that question was. The question was, um, let me share my screen. Um, there we go. So we're only gonna do one question and briefly touch on it, and then we'll uh, continue reading from verse 11. So Alma asks us, do you look forward with an eye of faith? Interesting question. <laughs> um, so now that I've read that, I'll stop that. Does anyone have any thoughts about an eye of faith? Well, my mind fills with, let thy eye be single. And so my mind kind of initially first goes to, I guess it's kind of the esoteric thoughts because initially we have two eyes. And so two eyes allow us to see uh, duality. Mm -hmm. And so we should use our, our, our single eye, our intent, our mind's eye, some people might even say it could slightly involve the gland in our head. You know, it says we have an eye that might be seen on our forehead, but I think having it, having your focus and your intent be on God and not the forward, the past, living now, today, is a start in that direction of keeping that eye single to the glory of God. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of some of the notes that I wrote down. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. <laughs> so um, I looked up, and I don't know the Hebrew language too well, but I do know some of the letters of the alphabet. And so there's a letter. I don't know if you can see it. It's uh, my bad drawing, but that, this one here. Ayan? Yes. Ayan? Mm -hmm. Looks like a Y. And 
it's what Matt said. It's the uh, alphabet num uh, letter pronounced ayin, ayin, which actually means I in Hebrew. It's um, also the numerology number of it is the number 70. I don't know too much about the symbolism of that, but I know that there are number 70 is brought up in the canon of scripture a lot as a symbol. So the meaning of I in Hebrew um, is, and this is what I just found on the internet, so correct me, um, is insight and discernment. Now, it's not our insight and our discernment, so it's not man's, but it's God's eye. It's God's insight, God's perception, God's discernment, and that is the eye of God. So if we're having an eye of faith, we're viewing things through God's eye, through God's insight, God's perception and discernment. And I thought uh, it was interesting in Egyptian um, religion, uh, Egyptian belief, uh, you have the eye of Ra and you have the eye of Horus. And I think both of those are different attributes of God. Um, different attributes of the Godhead. And so one of the eyes, I'm not sure if it's the left or the right, but the eye of Ra um, represents priesthood, power, judgment, and knowledge. And the other eye, if it's Horus, um, if it's left or right, I'm not sure, it um, can represent protection and wisdom. So there you have like the masculine and the feminine, the um God the Father and his counterpart, God the Mother, it's like one, like the two eyes are in one wholeness. Um, so that is what I means in Hebrew. And in Hebrew, faith is pronounced emuna, emuna, which is E-H, this is how you pronounce it, E-H, M-O-O-N-A-H, emuna. And the root word of that is trust and reliance. So if we put uh, I-N and Imuna together, which I don't think, I don't know if they do that, but it translates as faithfulness, which is one of the names of God. And so the name is more than mere belief on our part, but rather it's a statement about God and who God is and God's character and perfections. And uh, like Sarah and Abraham, their life was full of this reliance upon uh, God. And so that faith that they had, that emuna, resulted in receiving faithfulness, which is the a name of God, and receiving promises of hope. And then it goes on, like um, promises of hope equates to knowledge and to know is to believe. And when you have promises of hope and knowledge, then you are walking in emuna. And um, so the, the meaning of the root word of faith has changed from that Hebrew origin of an aspect of God to now today, faith is like a wisp. It's a a mere believing without actual evidence. But um, in Hebrew, it is definitely action and evidence-based. On the um, part where you talked about the letter changing, if you go mm -hmm. back and find the Genesis accounts in Hebrew, there's an ancient Hebrew, and it would just say, let thy ayin, and so it just has the letter ayin, and it's saying be single. In later accounts, they say I and Ra, like you were talking about, but the Ra changes it to not God. Mm. And so now it says, let thy I be single, not God. You know, so in other words, if you, if you look at it, the, word, the words have changed and the words that they're using now, the scripture has literally changed its meaning to where it says, let thy I not be single to God. They change out the Hebrew letters and put them together over time, and it's completely 180 the meaning. So, anciently it says, "Have our I be single to God." More modernly, it says, "I not be single to God." Wow, 
That's quite a change. That is quite some significant change. Opposite. 180 degrees out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, do you want to hear a little bit more about the Hebrew word? Because <laughs> I have just a little bit more. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course. Okay. Um, I also learned just on the internet, so, you know, you can believe everything on the internet. But um, emuna uh, is also based on the word amen. Um, and so in the Hebrew understanding, amen is like a, they called it a festive affirmation or saying like may it be so something is so it's real it's the word it's the stamp the seal so something amen means it can be affirmed in reality it's not an arbitrary thing or a baseless belief so um there's another word emunim which is another attribute of God. It means loyal, one who is trustworthy. Amen, which sounds like amen, means that one has experienced God. And amana is the agreement of loyalty. So it's kind of covenantal. So in Hebrew, a word represents a concept of God. So one of those character attributes of God who can be trusted. His deeds are trustworthy and he is loyal to his actions and promises. So emuna is the trust due to trust we have in God due to God's actions, which affirm the truth of the trust. And so belief in God is not the same as trust in God. So they gave an example of the Israelites before they had crossed the sea they had belief in God um, but they didn't have trust in God and so it wasn't until after God parted the waters and they walked through that they then had emuna they were walking in emuna because the trust the belief became trust as they saw God's intervention and then it became knowledge and truth is action which means you're in emuna so anyway, Sounds that's like all I got. Were, when they were taken through on dry ground, that was a covenant. It gave them hope or they began when they knew God, they had hope. So it's funny. You can see it the same thing today, you know, by the promise of God before that, they're having faith that he's going to help them. And then all of a sudden he's helped them and taking them through on dry ground. So now they have a sure promise. Yeah. So and that's what hope is. Mm -hmm. Right. It's that sure promise and so if Alm was asking what was he asking um do we look forward with an eye of faith something like that I don't want to share my screen again it's, it boggles my brain sometimes <laughs> he's asking I think have we seen God in action in our life and if you have God is faithful God can be trusted you're walking in imuna. So then the following questions he asks are based on your actual experience with God, knowing that God will not lie. God is action-based. And uh, when he says a thing over your life or speaks a promise, according to like you would do our part, it will come to pass. So, yeah. Okay, now we can jump to verse 11. <laughs> There's no other thoughts. There's a kind of Hebrew lesson, but yeah, that was kind of fun. Are we in Alma in. 3 still, or where are we at? Yes, Alma 3, verse 11. Hi, baby Adam. <laughs> Oh, what? Oh, we are in Alma chapter three, and someone can read verse eleven. I I can read. It's Carrie. And now I say unto you, all that are desirous 
to follow the voice of the good shepherd. Come ye out of the wicked and be ye separate and touch not their unclean things. And behold, their names shall be blotted out, but the names of the wicked shall not be numbered among the names of the righteous, that the word of God may be fulfilled, which saith, the names of the wicked shall not be mingled with the names of my people, for the names of the righteous shall be written in the book of life. And unto them will I grant an inheritance at my right hand. And now, my brethren, what have you to say against this? I say unto you, if you speak against it, it matters not, for the word of God must be fulfilled. For what shepherd is there among you, having many sheep, thou thought watch over them, that the wolves enter not, and devour his flock? And behold, if a sheep enter his flock, a wolf enter his flock, Doth he not driven him out? Yea. And, and at the last, if he can, he will destroy him. And now I say unto you that the good shepherd doth call after you. And if you will hearken unto his voice, he will bring you into his fold, and ye are his sheep. And he commandeth you that ye suffer no ravenous wolf to enter among you, that ye not be destroyed. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. There's a lot in that verse. Wow, is there? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's break it down a little. Uh, I'd love to hear thoughts. My first thought was, um, we're in the first line, all you that are desirous to follow the voice of the Good Shepherd, which presumes that we can choose to become sheep if we hear God's voice, even in the, the messengers that he sends then we are one of his sheep. I like the, that analogy. When it says, come ye out from the wicked and be separate, he's talking to those already of the church who have taken upon them the covenant um, from King Benjamin. And so I just think of what is wickedness um, and unclean things and I wonder if that I mean it could be a lot of things I wonder if it can be teaching deliberately incomplete truths or trying to um, take the Lord's sheep to become you know in priestcraft to um, <coughs> be their shepherd rather than pointing them to Christ um, Breaking ordinances. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, this is one of those where it's talking about that if you listen and it kind of the still small voice and hearken to it, this is where the sounds like the angels are sitting. The, the wheat and the tares, you know, mm -hmm. you must hear the voice and separate yourselves out. Don't stay there and participate in what's going on. Seems and like we have a lot of that going on right now in our day where people yeah. want to come in and separate the sheep and try to steal them from the Lord. We see that in other verses. Mm -hmm. Other places, I guess I should say. And so this is talking about that right there, you know, don't let yourself be. Because it creates a situation kind of like in our, in our covenant situation where right now, if we have the, the wolves with the sheep, then trust can't be formed. So we can't grow to love each other with the kind of hearts we need when we have people that are taking advantage of those hearts. Mm -hmm. And so we can't come together to be one when we have one amongst us who will in essence because we're supposed our offering uh, as a righteous people is our clean blood and so if we have somebody who will come along and our clean blood in a wrong way then we don't have that offering to make our clean blood being our our will and our obedience would be my thought mm -hmm. 
And so not touching that wicked thing or that uncleanliness. Uh, when it says like watching out for wolves that enter, like I think there's a fine line there because I've certainly been amongst people that thought me and my family were wolves when we're just us. <laughs> like, um, and so I think it goes back to the covenant where um, to pursue correct judgment um, from the Lord's own heart. And there's a labor that we need to perform in studying the word of God so that we can have uh, the gift of discernment and then navigating about that in a, um, what is that? To be as wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. Um, Cause we don't want to go against people with our weapons. Um, in our words or behaviors, we want to just be wise to avoid situations and stand as a sentinel, like um, the testimony of St. John says, stand as a sentinel at all times awaiting um, words from the Lord. Well, I think the scriptures have very much been a liahona or they've been a, a, a cipher for us because as we have the people have been given a covenant and we began to walk in it, we see in it a warning of these things in front of us. We see it start taking place in front of us. And so then we use the scriptures as our tool and guide. So like the women's council was the scriptures being used as a tool and guide. Okay, how do we judge this? Oh, it very clearly laid out in our covenant what things to judge and what things to not lay hold of. You know, it's like some things that said, ah, don't worry about these things. Only here's just a few things that if you see these happening amongst you, you know where you're at. All of a sudden you're looking at the map and you can see where you're at. Oh, we're not, we're kind of like we're not having the liahona. And so as we listen to the scriptures, they become the guide. Mm -hmm. It's like very, I've, to me, it seems like as our problems have started to show up as we're testing ourselves and trying to walk this walk, the scriptures are laying out before us a guide, a standard on how to do these things. So we are living a guidance standard right now we wrote one but we're also living one right now because if you wrote a history as what's happened in the last seven years since the covenant it would be very much a guidance standard the things we've learned along the way how to identify what's taking place anyway i'm talking more than my fair share oh no you're not <laughs> it's great thank you thank you what so you mean like our scriptures are the guidance standard <sighs> It seems like that's how they're, yes, they're the guiding standard. They're guiding us through this, the standard of how to behave, mm -hmm. how to judge, to judge. I mean, golly, most of the time we don't want to put our hands in that, but it says judge righteous judgments. Set yeah. your women up to be the judges of, you know, we saw that when we just read that. We saw Corey Hoare and all these guys coming out wanting to preach and they set up judges. Well, today the women are our judges. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I laugh at that because like women have like we went priesthood, we went priesthood, but then okay, here's a judgment seat. No, I don't want that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good morning, Carleen. We are um in chapter three and about to read verse 12 of Alma. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. My alarm must have not gone off at the right time, so I apologize. Hey, you I arrived. used that excuse yesterday. You can't use that today. <laughs> I was going to say, you arrived precisely when you should have arrived, like Gandalf says. <laughs> hey, what verse is it? Um, Alma chapter 3, verse 12. If someone would like to carry on reading. I can. Thank you, Melissa. And now I, Alma do command you in the language of him who have commanded me that ye observe to do the words which I have spoken unto you. I speak by the way of command unto you that belong to the church and unto those who do not belong to the church. I speak by way of invitation saying, come, and be baptized unto repentance, that ye also may be partakers of the fruit of the tree of life. Thank you. You can continue if there's no comments. Well, we need to go on to Alma 4. 
Uh -huh. The end. <laughs> And now it came to pass that Alma had made an end of speaking unto the people of the church, which was established in the city of Zarahemla, of ordained priests and elders by laying on of hands, according to the order of God, to preside and watch over the church. And it came to pass that whosoever did not belong to the church, who repented of their sins, were baptized unto repentance and were received into the church and it came to pass that whosoever did belong to the church that did not repent of their wickedness and humbled themselves before god those who were lifted up in the pride of their hearts the same were rejected and their names were blotted out that their names were not numbered among those of the righteous and those that began to establish and those they began to establish the order of the church in the city of Zarahemla. Now I would that ye should understand that the word of God was liberal unto all, that none were deprived of the privilege of assembling themselves together to hear the word of God. Nevertheless, the children of God were commanded that they should gather themselves together oft, join in fasting and mighty prayer in behalf of the welfare of souls of those who knew not God. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, in the verse that before the one that Melissa, the first one Melissa read, it's interesting, I've never seen it before because he's basically saying, I'm commanding those that belong to the church to be taught, baptized. <clears throat> in the case, they were already baptized. And also those that don't belong to the church to be yeah. baptized. Yeah. Um, it's in the same paragraph. And then down here, it says uh, something about they did not repent of their wickedness, so they cast them out of the church, basically. Yeah. So it, is that a... Um, a, uh, a what I want to say not a proof but a a message a message that there can be rebaptism that's you know that if we've been yeah. baptized once in into the into the fellowship uh, can we be baptized again because we need to repent um, I mean is it you know just a thought, because I know that some people, well, I know that there's rebaptism going on. So is that one of the messages that that um, that supports that right there? Yeah, I think so. I think um, so. Alma, he's beginning a ministry throughout the church, right, to all the different cities, and so the city of Zarahemla um, was already established as a church. But mm -hmm. it had been some time since, I guess, Alma had preached there, perhaps, or there had been a lot of turning away from uh, King Benjamin's initial covenant. So in, back in the previous verses, when Alma says that he gave the judgment seat to someone else, but retained his seat, his priesthood yeah. or position in the holy order, now he's going to reteach them, I think, sign of one of the signs of accepting um, God's work currently underway in their day, in our day, is baptism. And yeah. so, yeah, whenever God does a work or he's correcting or relaying a foundation to be a part of that, we show up by baptism, even if we've been baptized before, I think. I Okay, so, you know, we... We were baptized. I was baptized, and most of you, when I was eight years old. Mm -hmm. When I was baptized with the with the fellowship, uh, then I I I was baptized. Um, it's my understanding that you can be rebaptized if you want to refresh that baptism. Now, is that what you're saying, Renee, or are you just referring to those that were baptized and had been away from the church for a while? You know, I think for myself anyway, 
I think it's really uh, personal and between the person and God. I remember walking with some groups where it was like, if you didn't get baptized with the group when they said to get baptized, you were like hide, concealing sins. And, and so often I had been baptized for the sake of people pleasing to be part of that group. And so if baptism um, comes after repentance, like I'm for myself, I'm totally fine with being rebaptized whenever I feel of myself to um, repent of something or to lay down something. I do use rebaptism as a form of worship between God and I, but now it's more private and personal. And it's for me, it's refreshing when I feel I need it not to be part of now some group or to fit in with some group or, um, yeah, I think it's really individual and personal. But whenever you have like an authorized administrator like Alma, um, Joseph Smith, Denver, um, there is always an initial baptism. And even if um, people in this dispensation were just rebaptized after talk 10 and haven't been rebaptized since, I think that's totally fine. Like, absolutely fine. It's between okay, just, mm, one person. Yeah. Though. Yeah. Okay. So in a way, that scripture would support that if we wanted to use it. Well, you, yeah. I, was, I just got back into Alma 3 while you were talking about that. And I thought it was, I don't know why my mind's hanging up on it, but on that last verse in 12. He and said, where we're, okay. So Alma 3 verse 12, the very last you know, one we read. And he says, Alma, he says, and now I, Alma, do command you in the language who hath commanded me so he's been commanded to be baptized and he's commanding all those who are a member of the church they're commanded to come unto you at, and but it's only an invitation to those who don't yet belong so in other words if you're hanging out with the church you should see things in such a way you're being commanded you know in other words, if you don't do this, you're so another kind of like right now, we have a covenant, but we know there's another one we seek. We're being commanded to prepare for that. The I would guess by this wording that the consequence of those who are this far along and don't help, that's kind of like when the Lord says, if you come and join me and you begin working on my errand, and not then walk away from it, greater will be your condemnation. So if you're this far along in the game and you walk out now, your condemnation is greater, a greater woe than for those who are still being invited in because they haven't. So in other words, we've partaken of a, a pre, uh, maybe a condemnatory covenant, you know, in a certain priesthood preparing for another one. And if they haven't seen that and they're still hearing the invitation, they're invited in the same way we are. However, the consequence of not coming in is going to be greater for those who've already come in so far. Because the Lord says, once you've come in and started participating in this, if you back out, then your promise is gone. Yeah, and I think it's been said to you lose everything um, that you've gained up to that point. So you know, a lot of places it's kind of in covenant this serious. And a lot of places in the scriptures, it talks about if you don't do certain things, you'll be condemned in this world and the world to come. And it says sometimes the world after that. So, you know, it talks about three woes or three worlds or three levels. It's like, yeah, you can knock yourself back a long ways here. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, part of the merciful part is God takes our understanding like, even though I feel like so much has been given and laid out through Joseph Smith and through Denver, like so much has been given that I think a lot of questions we have, the answers are there, but not everyone understands or comprehends it the same. And there are some with like really sincere hearts that are learning little by little. And so God takes where we're at in our growth and our understanding and he it's based on that you know what I mean so someone who doesn't have I don't know an understanding of the fathers and the covenants 
they're not going to be, I don't feel, condemned. But if someone has an understanding and turns away from that and deliberately rejects things, there's a greater condemnation there. Is that what you're meaning, Matthew? There's that now. I'm My mind's going on, okay, now Alma Four, the next one. He's sitting there laying it out, breaking it down a little bit more, at least in my mind. He's, he's saying... And now it came to pass after Alma had made an end of speaking unto the people of the church, which was established in the city, he ordained priests and elders by laying on hands, according to the order of God, to preside and watch over. So those who had already come in, he set them up into positions to watch over the church. And it came to pass that whosoever did not belong to the church repented of their sins and were baptized. Okay, now back to the ones that had already joined in early, but it's saying... Um, and also it came to pass that whosoever did not, or who did belong to the church that did not repent of wickedness and humble themselves before God, I mean those who were lifted up in the pride of their heart. So now you have a group amongst them that's saying, ah, we're better than the others. We're being obedient. We came along. We're first. Uh, we're the most righteous. And they're being lifted up in pride. So basically you're, you're seeing of righteous people who've recognized and are becoming servants and other people that are recognized it, but they're becoming persecutors of those who haven't recognized it. And so the greater condemnation is coming on to those who've recognized it, but then they're beginning to be lifted up in pride and persecute the newer of the saints. Sorry, I'm talking so fast. I can't even breathe. <laughs> <laughs> Did I answer your question? I, I was just seeing that. No, that's all good. It's all good. Yeah, I think both of you are correct. I also love how God comes in and levels the playing field. And so even those who do actually know more have the opportunity to um, kneel and serve and be rebaptized or, you know, um, he levels it so that we're all on the same ground. I thought it also interesting that, um, so there's where it says um, down the, towards the end of four, it mentions um, none were deprived of the privilege of assembling themselves together to hear the words of God. Nevertheless, the children of God were commanded that they should gather themselves together oft and join in fasting and mighty prayer in behalf of the welfare of the souls of those who knew not God. And so there's one of those titles in there, um, children of God. So if angels or messengers are sent to sons of men or children of men, and they come and teach correct faith. And then with that correct faith, the children of men then prove by their heed and diligence to the word that's been given. Um, at some point, as they're walking in that, they become children of God. And so I looked up in the glossary, well, what is a child of God? <laughs> what is children of God so let me just look at that in the glossary it says children of God for the redeemed are the children of God and he dwells within them Christ taught and lived this and blessed are all the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. So they are people that are individually redeemed. Are they ones that have come into the presence of the Lord? That's what I'm wondering, because in the, in the covenant, the, the language is you become sons and daughters of God. Mm -hmm. oh, and sons and daughters, they... those are children, right? Mm -hmm. And so those who've partaken of the covenant have become sons and daughters or plurally children. Mm -hmm. would be what i'm thinking so but sons and daughters is again a different covenant from what we have we're known as my people my people mm -hmm. 
or you shall be my people. Right. <laughs> There's that shall, which is the progression. Um, so then I was like, well, what does that look like? So if there are people that are children. individually redeemed, children of God, and they are meeting together oft, maybe in like a, I don't know, the word came to my head, a solemn assembly for the specific purpose of praying and fasting, that God would make himself and his word known um, to others who are on this covenantal path. Like to me, that's beautiful. I would love those who have been individually redeemed, who are called children of God or sons and daughters to pray and fast that that would happen for me too. Right. I wonder if that's something that might be coming in the temple. That's where my mind was just going, because if, if say they learned something new in gaining that covenant, which those covenants and everything that happens in the temple is for teaching. Now let's say those that have been taught this new prayer gathered together so many days a week and they participate in this, this new prayer. And maybe the others around can observe that it's taken place in some crazy way. Or they oh, know exactly. of it. Yeah. I mean, Would what if they true? gather together to pray and there's a, a, a all of a sudden there's a, a light that goes to heaven, you know, and they're like, oh, look, they're doing it again. The light's on, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wonder if that is the a prayer circle or the true order of prayer. That's the words I almost used, but I was trying to be too <laughs> not be. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I found uh, in Preserving the Restoration on page 531, just a quick short paragraph. It says, the gospel must come to life through us or we have no hope. Joseph also said, we cannot claim these promises which were made to the ancients for they are not our property, merely because they were made to the ancient saints. Yet, if we are the children of the Most High and are called with the same calling with which they were called and embrace the same covenant, I just thought, is that Christ? Is Christ the covenant <laughs> that they embraced? and are faithful to the testimony of our Lord as they were. So that's the testimony of Jesus in my mind. We can approach the Father in the name of Christ as they approached him and for ourselves obtain the same promises. These promises when obtained, if ever by us, will not be because Peter, John, and the other apostles with the churches as Sardis, Pergamos, Philadelphia, and elsewhere walked in the fear of God and had power and faith to reveal and obtain them. But it will be because we ourselves have faith and approach God in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, even as they did. And when these promises are obtained, they will be promises directly to us or they will do us no good. We cannot rely on the sacrifices of Joseph and Hiram to save us, nor claim a covenant long since changed and broken by all of the sects claiming Joseph. We must have the faith to renew and then keep a covenant with God, which I felt tied in with what Alma was doing in renewing the covenant there and with the people in Zarahemla um, and then the children of God interceding for others. There was a lot in that paragraph. <laughs> yes. All right, we can move on if we want to. Verse two. I can read. Thank you, Carleen. Okay. 
And now it came to pass that when Alma had made these regulations, he departed from them, yea, from the church, which was in the city of Zarahemla, and went over into the east of the river Sidon, into the valley of Gideon, there having been a city built, which was called the city of Gideon, which was in the valley that was called Gideon, being called after the man who was slain by the hand of Nehor with the sword. And Alma went and began to declare the word of God unto the church, which was established in the valley of Gideon, according to the revelation of the truth of the word which had been spoken by his fathers, and according to the spirit of prophecy which was in him, according to the testimony of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who should come to redeem his people from their sins, and the holy order by which he was called. And thus it was. Amen. I wonder why Gideon is mentioned so many times in that scripture. Any ideas? Well, I think Gideon, well, he was slain by Nehor. Yeah, he was a great man and everything, but yeah. they, they had to cart. Why not just say it once? Right, yeah, because mm -hmm. they had to carve on those plates, right? And it was so hard. Um, Didn't yeah. we look that up a while back, what Gideon meant? Because Gideon had been an officer in the armies. And so that whole area out there that's called the Valley of Gideon and the city of Gideon, because he had fought at the head of an army and claimed that land for the people. So that's why it all bears his name, the Valley of Gideon, the city of Gideon and so forth. Then he's the same guy when he's old, it gets struck down and killed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe it's because he's like a national hero. I, you know. Well, he like certainly, <laughs> maybe, he certainly <laughs> had courage to stand up and fight for the truth and the freedom and the liberties of the people. Mm -hmm. I just got into the chat quickly oh well someone said something let me see oh all right bye oh she's already gone <laughs> diane had to go that's fine um it's, it's interesting at the very end of this verse that once again it says according to the testimony of jesus the son of god who should come to redeem his people from their sins and the holy order by which he was called. You see right there, it's still referring to the people of the church and all those as his people, but they're not sons and daughters. They're not his children. So to me, it's kind of showing them, I don't know, I'm tending to think that there's three categories. Still, to those who haven't recognized it, those who have partially joined in and they're trying to have themselves I guess, like you said, enough heed and dis diligence to be to be obedient to now not just be virgins, but be virgins with oil. Mm -hmm. And I think becoming a son or daughter of God is when he would, well, I think the picture in my head is that he would call you by name, say your sins are, forgot are forgiven you, and this day I have begotten you. Like, I think that then is a son or a daughter. And then they have an oil in their lamp that they can't give to anybody else. You can't get any other way. The only way to get that oil in your lamp is through him. And so mm -hmm. they have an oil that they can't just, oh, give us of your oil. Well, you, we can't give you this knowledge. You have to get that part yourself. And yeah. so. Mm -hmm. And so there's the testimony of Jesus there, which Alma has which I think is Christ's testimony of Alma as a son, as a high priest. And he is part of the holy order. And it reminds me of <coughs> Hiram Smith and his zeal, his desire to go out and teach. But he wasn't quite yet prepared. And God said, wait a little longer. Wait until you have my word, my rock, my gospel. And there were four things. And I think it's a progression of um, yeah, becoming a son adequate knowledge, being of the holy order. And then you have that ratification of God's authority upon you to preach that word. 
And I think that's coming for a lot of us, hopefully. Um, and right now, like we can edify each other and um, point each other to Christ. But this is like a, a greater role. Um, this is an administrator, I think, what Alma's walking in. So the testimony of Jesus on each of our lives is really important. That's that surety. That's um, that hope <laughs> that you have part with Christ. Uh, we have time to read a little bit more into chapter five. Let's do it. If anyone chapter wants five, to... The words of Alma, which he delivered to the people in Gideon, according to his own record. Behold, my beloved brethren, seeing that I have been permitted to come unto you, therefore I attempt to address you in my language, yea, by my own mouth, seeing that is the first time that I have spoken unto you by the words of my mouth, I having been wholly confined to the judgment seat, having had much business that I could not come unto you, and even I could not have come now at this time, were it not that the judgment seat hath been given to another to reign in my stead. And the Lord in such in much mercy hath granted that I should come unto you. And behold, I have come having great hopes and much desire that I should find that ye have ye had humbled yourselves before God, and that ye had continued in the supplicating of his grace, that I should find that ye were blameless before him, that I should find that ye were not in the awful dilemma that our brethren were in at Zarahemla. But blessed be the name of God, that he hath given unto me to know, yea, hath given unto me the exceeding great joy of knowing that they are established again in the way of righteousness. And I trust, according to the Spirit of God, which is in me, that I shall also have joy over you. It was interesting to me, my mind went to uh, him coming out of the judgment seat, kind of Equated in my mind to Denver retiring. I was also thinking that it's kind of like in a way as well, Alma's 10 talks throughout the, the church corridor. Right. <laughs> Should I read on? Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> Nevertheless, I do not desire that my joy over you should come by the cause of so much afflictions and sorrow which I have had for the brethren at Zarahemla. For behold, my joy cometh over them after waiting through much afflictions and sorrow. But behold, I trust that ye are not in a state of so much unbelief as were your brethren. I trust that ye are not lifted up in the pride of your hearts. Yea, I trust that ye have not set your hearts upon riches and the vain things of the world. Yea, I trust that you do not worship idols but ye do worship the true and living God, and that ye look forward for the remission of your sins with an everlasting faith, which is to come. Now, see, to me right there, I see that as kind of like the process of uh, waking up, coming out of the LDS church, when all of a sudden you're not persecuting those around you. You're not, your eyes aren't stuck on the riches of the world, paying more tithing so you can get more money back but you're not vainly looking at things that you've woken up and are participating as a awoken individual versus one who's just mulling along with the goats. <laughs> right, and not worshipping idols or not looking to a man or a woman to divine God for you, but you're going yourself to the true and living God. Like that to me is a personal relationship. And they're looking forward for the remission of their sins. Yeah, that's a direct connection with God. Should I continue reading? Or are we good? See where we at? Okay. Yeah. Another. For behold, I say unto you, there be many things to come. And behold, there is one thing which is of more importance than they all. For behold, the time is not far distant that the Redeemer liveth and cometh among his people. Behold, 
I do not say that he will come among us at the time of his dwelling in his mortal tabernacle. For behold, the Spirit hath not said unto me that, that this should be the case. Now as to the thing I do not as to this thing I do not know, but this much I do know, that the Lord God hath power to do all things which are according to his word. But behold, the Spirit hath said this much unto me, saying, Cry unto this people, saying, Repent ye, repent ye, and prepare the way of the Lord, and walk in his paths, which are straight. For behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and the Son of God cometh upon the face of the earth. And behold, he shall be born of Mary at Jerusalem, which is the land of our forefathers, she being a virgin, a precious and chosen vessel, who shall be overshadowed and conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost, and bring forth a son, yea, even the Son of God. And he shall go forth suffering pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind, and this that the word might be fulfilled which saith, he will take upon him the pains and the sickness, sicknesses of his people, and he will take upon him death, that he may loose the bands of death which bind his people. And he will take upon him their infirmities, that his bowels may be filled with mercy according to the flesh, that he may know according to the flesh how to succor his people according to their infirmities. Now the Spirit knoweth all things, nevertheless the Son of God suffereth according to the flesh, and he may take, might take upon him the sins of his people, that he might blot out their transgressions according to the power of deliverance. And now behold, this is the testimony which is in me. Uh, beautiful to me that Alma knows the name of Christ's mother and makes me wonder He's probably seen the vision of all, so he's able to relate that to them like straight away of Mary and being the mother of God and, and Christ's role. And um, yeah, looking forward to that. Is this the first time we know Mary's name? It isn't, is it? No, I think in uh, Nephi in the beginning. It, it's mentioned. I think. I think. I can't remember. I did um, a few more minutes. I really like um, Christ Saka and focusing on that. Let me get a page up. Might be nice to finish on this. It describes how the Lord in prayer began vicariously suffering. And he goes through these waves of torment, which the Lord, which was the Lord kneeling in prayer, exposed to the guilt, the shame, the re recriminations, the difficulties, the pains of both offending God and your fellow men and being offended by your fellow man and the torment of the mind and the spirit and the soul in trying to overcome and reconcile yourself back into the presence of God the Father, shedding all of what you feel when you are smitten by the rod of the mouth of that pure being who is God the Father, and the recognition that you are out of adjustment you are out of sync with the almighty you are not good and pure and holy and you are in the presence of a good and a just and a holy being the gospel reflects that an angel came strengthening him which is not altogether an accurate description of what went on he the father's presence never left the son throughout all his sufferings and indeed, part of the son's sufferings was caused by the necessity to reconcile peacefully his experience of this unclean, unworthy state 
with the feelings of shame and guilt that are caused by not being reconciled with God. And then overcoming that and being able to reconcile himself again with the Father and coming to a place of peace and harmony and at oneness with the Father that this awful experience had disrupted. It shattered the harmony that existed between the Father and the Son that had existed throughout his entire ministry. And it put the son into the same position as the worst of the sinners who had jarringly disassociated themselves unworthily with the father. And now here he is feeling all of that, but being in the presence of the father as if he were advanced to, to the moment of the final judgment and coming before the bar of a perfect and pure God, but doing so unprepared, unworthy, unreconciled, unrepentant, and filled with guilt and shame. And all of that was put upon him so that he could reconcile himself to the Father, reconcile himself and overcome the feelings of guilt and remorse of sin. The Lord is ever willing to forgive us, but once we are forgiven, then the obligation is imposed upon us to forsake our sins and then go on as worthy as we would be had we not sinned in the first place. We have to leave that behind us. He readily forgives, but once forgiven, we're supposed to not only confess, but to forsake our sins. And the forsaking of the sin and the leaving of the temptation behind becomes an enormous challenge for us. And it was the challenge that he faced in Gethsemane. And it's the place he goes to now that he's gone through the entirety of this atonement. And he's worked it all through. He doesn't go to the cross. He doesn't go to somewhere else. He goes to this moment, this profound, jarring disassociation that existed between him and the Father that he had to find a way to overcome and to reconcile in order to be once again in harmony with him. And he facilitates our ability to do exactly the same thing by taking upon him vicariously through that suffering through that price that he paid, the ownership and forgiveness for everything so that he can forgive. Forgiving is the limit of what he can do. He can't make us better. He finished his preparations. And then having finished his preparations, he says, therefore I command you to repent. I don't want you to go through what I went through. I'll forgive you, but I command you, repent, confess them, forsake them, leave them behind and become something bigger, better, more reconciled to God through the love that you ought to have in your heart. For the fact that he has been willing to re-accept you, he has been willing to comfort you, take you in and embrace you as a member of his family able to stand clean before him because you've abandoned what it was that separated you. So I really loved that. <clears throat> Go to Christ for his sucker. Confessing our sins, our weaknesses before Christ. He's more than willing to take that upon himself. And he truly understands, like, both he and his consort truly understand um, everything we can possibly go through. Okay, there we go. <laughs> That's some happy music. They're making tortillas in the back. <laughs> I love that you're making tortillas with happy music so that the tortillas are happy when we eat them. Yes. <laughs> <I love that. laughs> so um, I just got a text from Adrian. 
and she said, could we for our prayer this morning? Rex has been having serious health trouble and could we please pray for him and add him to the list? So I'm not too sure what's happening with Rex, but I've heard little bits that he's, uh, is he in hospital, Andrew? Um, oh, by the way, Andrew's here. <laughs> Hello, Andrew. <laughs> eating his breakfast. Okay. So I will add Rex um, onto our list. And would anyone like to um, begin the prayer or offer a prayer? Well, I can start it out. Thank you, Matt. Our Father who art in heaven, we're very grateful for this opportunity to come together as, as those striving to be your children and sons and daughters and your people. We pray that our minds may be washed clear of all the distractions and all our improper understandings that may, we may be have an eye single to thy glory and to the truth that we may not be distracted and find ourselves in on straight paths, but that we may have a straight path to follow back to you and be certain of that path through our obedience that we can find our way back to you, that we may be saved and help to have charity for our brethren, that we may participate in saving each other and covering each other with a cloak of charity. Father, we pray for <clears throat> all these families and souls, individuals, groups, those that are suffering that are on this list. For Harvillen and Monica, Brian and Jennifer, Evan and Diane, for Matt and his family, for John and Anna, Andrew and Eva, Janine and Mike, Sean and Jenna May, and for his mother, Karen, for Jacob and Adrian Getz, for Annie and Ashley and Lou, for Carrie and his restaurant and all the people he serves, and his workers for Carly and her family and for her son for Melissa and her family for Jonathan and Carrie Alex and Lisa David and Michelle and their family it's for Samantha and trying couples of times as he's going through for Carlene and Greg for Keith and Karen Cannon and Mariah and Michael for Kyle and Kyle Bacher Denver and Stephanie, for Tanya and Kenny Similar, for Julia and Daryl, who are not able to be with us today, for Janae and Ryan and their son Aiden, Dina Bailey, Summer, Chris, and for all those that are preparing for uh, his, his funeral and have words to say that our hearts can support them at this time and through their troubles. For Tina and Aaron Kibbe and their daughter, Emma. For Ron and Bunny. For Colton and Erica, Kathy and Natasha and Bryce, for the Bartels. For Patricia and for Paula Hurst and her family and children. Father, we ask that thy, thy nursing, the, 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 that we as thy children may be nursed by thy, thy all knowing knowledge and understanding, and that we may find the path back to thee through the the darkness, then we may cling to the word and we'll thankful for this opportunity each day to become familiar with it, that we recognize the words of angels. And these things we close in the name of Jesus Christ, our savior and the anointed one, Yeshua HaMashiach, amen. 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 Thank you, Matt. You are quite welcome. It's quite a list. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I love that people have asked um, for their names to be put on here. Like that's, a, that's something when people ask for their names and ask for prayer, that means they're opening themselves up to Christ's sucker as we just talked about and read. And yeah, I appreciate all your hearts and praying for each other and anyone else feel to offer a prayer? That was beautiful.
I'll just quickly say a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, to Matt's prayer, we um, pray together in behalf of Rex. And we don't know what's go what he's going through or the illness or trial that he's going through. I think it has to do with his health and um, his motor skills, perhaps. I, we pray, Father, that he may receive thy succor and that his family and he may be at peace with what is. I know that we always ask for healing and that is always our hope. But we also ask that Rex and everyone on this list may come to peace with whatever we are called to endure and to walk through and that through um, our relationship with thee we may receive the understanding and the help that we need in these moments we pray father continuously that you will take all of our hearts and bind up our wounds and pour in that oil of wisdom and knowledge and that all our tears may be wiped away at some point and we are grateful that we can hold on to your garment and have your presence be with us and have these records of scriptures to elevate our minds and our hearts. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Okay. Bye-bye. Well, have a great day. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.